Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Christine Kennedy, and on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening as we hear from a very popular speaker, Dr. Stuart Phillips, uh, who has broken all of our McMaster online webinar records. Uh, he is a leading researcher in the Department of Kinesiology here at McMaster. I've heard him speak many times, so you are in for a real treat tonight. Um, I am here in my office on campus and would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which this webinar is taking place is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. At McMaster, we start our events with a land acknowledgement to show both respect to Indigenous peoples and their enduring connection with their traditional territories and its histories, and as an important step in reconciliation. If you would like to learn more about the meaning of land to Indigenous people or the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, we'll put in the chat some links for you to read at your leisure. Tonight we are kicking off two weeks of programming as part of our At Home with Max series, and we are pleased to be partnering with the Optimal Aging Portal on this first event. Tonight's talk will be moderated by Dr. Anthony Levinson, who will join Dr. Phillips after this presentation, or after his presentation, to facilitate the Q&A session. We anticipate there will be many questions. Uh, but before I turn the proverbial mic over to Dr. Phillips, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. On the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, or I think it's in the top, if you're on an iPad, you'll see a little Q&A icon. Please ask your questions or put your questions in that icon and leave the chat to any technical questions you may have. If you're having problems with your audio, uh, we're going to post links throughout the talk. Um, so you'll see the links pop up, but we will also include all the links uh, in a forthcoming email. You will get a recording of this talk with all of the links that uh, Dr. Phillips will be um, presenting uh, in the talk. So we hope you will enjoy the next hour with Dr. Stuart Phillips. Do take it away. Well, thank you very much, Christine, uh, the Alumni Association, Dr. Levinson and the Optimal Aging Portal for putting on this talk. And thank you all to all of you out there for taking time out of your evening to, to listen to me. I'm sure for some of you, I'm probably going to be preaching to the converted, uh, but hopefully they'll make some converts along the way. Um, the first thing I want to do is to pose a question to you, but a question in the form of a video. And I think the video does a much better job than I ever could. And it's graphic and it really hammers home, I think, an important point about uh, aging. So just take. <laughs> Quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? Side. The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future at makehealthlast.ca. So the question that was posed in the video, I know some people may have had uh, some audio issues there, is what will your last 10 years look like? And so the gentleman that was playing the actor was clearly the same individual on one side of the video versus the other. And one is probably the vision of aging that we don't want to have, and that would be uh, spending the last 10 years of your life, or maybe even longer, in sickness. So before I get started, and, and, and usually this is the question that a lot of people want to ask, and so I don't offend anybody right off the bat, what are we talking about in terms of old? Well, we're all aging. It's a universal problem, and it's probably one of the greatest questions that mankind has wrestled with in terms of you know, how to age well. But the definitions are, are fairly established in that 
people from the ages of 65 to 74 are considered the young old. These are the middle old people, 75 to 84, and then 85 and above is the old old. And this is one of the fastest rising demographic segments of the Canadian population. Current estimates are that men in Canada live to approximately age of 80 and their, their female counterparts outlive them by on average about four years. So those are some pretty technical definitions. I, I might give you a more trite definition and I like this one by uh, Ogden Nash. He, he says that old age begins and middle age ends uh, the day our descendants outnumber our, our friends. But really, I want to dispel an aging myth right off the bat. And the aging myth is something like this, is that aging is an immutable characteristic. There's very little we can do about it. It's in our genes. You know, my dad died of this. My mom died of that early in their lives. And so there's very little that I can do. The fact is that in studies, and particularly those carried out in Scandinavian twin pairs, mostly from Denmark and Sweden, showed that variability in life for longevity between twin pairs was on average 15 years. And variability within twin pairs, which is probably more salient in answering the question of the importance of genetics, was plus or minus eight years. And so there are highly mutable characteristics to longevity that depend not on your genes, but on the things that you do with your life while you're here. So what do Canadians have to worry about? And these data are the latest that I could find from 2020 showing the causes of mortality in Canadians. And it probably, it might surprise some people to know that cancer is actually the leading cause of mortality in, in Canada. I'll break it out for you a little bit more in, uh, into men and women, but it's uh, substantially greater than, than heart disease. And you can see heart disease, no matter what people think, is actually a distant number two. And you may think, well, that's great. You know, less people are getting heart disease. But the reality is, is that we're so good now at treating heart disease and the end stage, uh, I guess, complications that are present, we're able to mitigate those. And people usually end up dying from other causes. You can see COVID-19 has actually crept onto the list. Accidents, cerebrovascular, that stroke, diabetes, and we've got Alzheimer's disease on there as well. So breaking it out into men and women, and, and the diseases really aren't that different. There are some that exist on this side, such as suicide, and that's really due to younger men. But there are things like Alzheimer's disease in women, which actually doesn't appear in the top 10 causes in men. But, so really what we're talking about is a laundry list of diseases that would include cancer, heart disease, lung disease, cerebrovascular disease, or stroke type two diabetes in particular, pneumonia and, and Alzheimer's. So bearing those in mind, I, I, I think that most people would sort of say, that's great, so what can I do to avoid these things? Well, so to be clear, it's not just about mortality. So there's nothing I'm gonna tell you tonight is that you know, we, can, we can help you live for hundreds of years or um, you know, mortality is holding constant at, at 100%. So the reality is that what I want to stress is it's about the quality of life that you have while you're here. And quality of life is determined by lots and lots of things. But one of the key things and the points I'd like to make is that physical mobility or the ability to move around is a key component to quality of life. So I'll just take a quick second here to have you think about which of the leading chronic diseases that Canadians uh, are suffering from and dying from are associated with a reduction in quality in life. So there are the diseases on the left. And, you know, you can just have a quick think about that. I, I wasn't, I was going to do a, a quick poll, but I decided, well, yeah, I'll just get everybody to think. Well, congratulations if you said all of them, because all of those diseases have associated with them a reduction in health-related quality of life. They affect something of your daily activities that you probably curb or do less of or are unable to do with the vigor you want or unable to do it at all. And you know, that is going to lower your quality of life. So there are definitions of what we call active or successful aging. And this is one that the World Health Organization uses and I've just underlined some key words here for you, one of which is health, participation, quality of life, 
a gain participation, extended healthy life expectancy, quality of life, autonomy, and independence. So it's a wonderful definition. I'll leave it up there for a little bit and you can kind of read through it. But I'm going to give you the, the quick synopsis. Or when you ask people and say, what does this definition mean to you? They, they tend to pick out the same words. Uh, health, definitely. Quality of life healthy life expectancy, which I'll uh, define for you, participation, autonomy, and independence. And I think all of us could agree that if we had those uh, up and until the last stages of our lives, that we would have lived a fairly fulfilling and high quality of life. In a graphical sense, we're talking about a concept people call compressed morbidity. Morbidity is the associated reduction in quality of life that occurs when people have disease. And you can see uh, in this graphical figure here, at a certain age, we get this rise shown by this wedge, and, and then this is, is when we die. But in the last century, we've added 30 plus years to our life expectancy. What we haven't added is the same period of extended life without morbidity. So we haven't compressed morbidity to the extent that we would like and have a life that is lived like this. So in other words, this is a full life. We don't have any reductions in quality of life. We still die at the same point here, but we have a better quality. And you can sort of see it graphically represented a little bit better. And I introduced to you here the term that a lot of people talk about, and that's health span. So, you know, aging is, an, is a continuous process. We'd like to spend as much of our life as we could with an increased health, uh, increased health span. So what we call optimal uh, longevity. So the question, and this is uh, Professor Frank Booth, a good friend and colleague of mine. He's a professor at the University of Missouri. And these sort of hypothetical questions were posed by him in an article he wrote probably about 20 years ago now. He said, what if there were a treatment that would lower the risk for all known chronic diseases? It would work regardless of your age, your sex, your race, or your pre-existing risk profile. It already has a large evidence base on which to base recommendations. It would save the healthcare system billions of dollars and cost comparatively little in return. And the great part about this treatment is that the side effect profile includes better prognoses for a variety of unrelated ailments, including depression, dementia, and even suicide incidents. And maybe with some of the things I'm going to tell you tonight, you could imagine if the effects that we were talking about came in a pill. If it did come in a pill, then I wouldn't be here at McMaster University. I'd be somewhere in, a, in an island talking to you uh, a long way away. But clearly it doesn't come in a pill, and it's probably no um, surprise to anybody that we're talking about physical activity. So the question I want to pose is the most viable foundation for active aging being physically active. And my quick answer is that I think it is a big part of it, maybe not all of it, but hopefully I can convince you that it's a major part of it. So first, the, the definitions out of the way. Physical activity is any movement of the body by skeletal muscles that results in energy being expended. It's going for a walk, it's gardening, it's getting up, it's brushing your teeth, it's combing your hair, lots of things. Exercise, on the other hand, is physical activity that is planned, structured, and repetitive, done with the aim of improving or maintaining physical fitness. So here's another poll for you. We have physical activity guidelines in Canada. They exist in the United States, all over the world. The World Health Organization has them. And what do they say? So here's the poll. Do we have to get 10,000 steps a day? Do we have to walk every day? What about 150 minutes of moderate to, physical, uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity per week? It has to be done for at least 30 minutes. You need to lift weights. Strengthening exercises twice per, per week. Stand more, sit less. What of these are part of the guidelines? So I'm just going to deal with the Canadian, what we call 24-hour movement guidelines, and they're pretty revolutionary. There is no other country that has a movement guideline that encompasses all 24 hours in the day, and we have them for 
uh, young kids, children, uh, adults, and then you could uh, en envision this as this is the remember this is the young old group here, and they're divided into you can see sweat, step, sleep, and sit, and they're the only movement guidelines that include anything about sleep with the recognition, the increasing recognition of the importance of a good night's sleep and what that has for health. So what do they say? So I'm, I'm taking this from the, uh, the, the guidelines for people over the age of uh, 65. So make your whole day matter. Move more is a big message. Reduce your sedentary time. Notice that they show a screen here. And so sitting and watching screens, uh, not for uh, your work, but for recreational purposes and getting a good night's sleep. The nitty gritty is in here around 150 minutes per week. That's two and a half hours per week. Muscle strengthening activities, balance activities. Here we go with the sleep again and limiting sedentary time to eight hours or less, which includes no more than three hours of recreational screen time and breaking up long periods of sitting by standing, moving around. So what can we expect if we follow these guidelines? And this is a uh, figure that shows um, the leisure time physical activity and, and the association with mortality in a large pool of what we call cohort analysis. And they, they've used something here they call hazard ratio. And the quick explanation of hazard ratio is the hazard here is, is death, is mortality. And the reference group is a group that does no physical activity. So their risk or their hazard is one. They start here. And for every incremental part of physical activity that you do in a given week, you can see this is this leisure time physical activity, not necessarily exercise. Your hazard is reduced down to around 0.6. So there's about a 40%, if you like, reduction in a, the hazard of mortality in a given period of time. And the nice part here is they've sort of flipped the, the graph on its head and how many years of life you gain. So the physical activity guidelines sit somewhere around here. So we're looking at, um, this is the 150 minutes, two days of strengthening, et cetera. And you're getting about an extra three to four years of life. Now imagine if that was a pill. Imagine if the headline in the Globe and Mail tomorrow were a uh, drug company invents pill that extends life by four years. Who wouldn't wanna take that? So let's focus a little bit on that 150 minutes per week. Sounds like a lot, it's two and a half hours and probably for some people they would say, well, you know, that, I don't know if I have the time to complete uh, that is five 30 minute periods, five days a week, for example. And the 150 minutes per week is the aerobic activity. And we talk in this sense then about improving uh, aerobic exercise and your fitness and, and heart and lung. And I'm, I'm going to phrase it within sort of the essential, I think, nature of what it means to be aerobically or cardiovascularly fit. The four vital signs, if you talk to your clinician or body temperature, your pulse or your heart rate, your respiration rate, and, and your blood pressure. But there's been a case made that the fifth vital sign is cardiorespiratory fitness. And the reality is, is that cardiorespiratory fitness integrates measures from the neural level to the cardiovascular level, to the respiratory level, to the neurological level, to the skeletal muscle, to the bone, et cetera. So any weak link along that way is going to compromise your cardiovascular fitness. And the point that they're making here is that low levels of cardiovascular fitness are associated with high rates of all-cause mortality and mortality from things like established risk factors, even smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. And so this group was making the case that we should talk about cardiorespiratory fitness or your activity patterns as a key part of your health. So probably the leading one, and most people would put, be able to put their finger on that, if I'm aerobically fit, my risk of heart disease is lower. I should be able to live longer and free from cardiovascular disease. And that is absolutely the case. I show a couple of these types of plots. They're called a forest plot. Anything again with this is an RR or a relative risk, anything less than one, 
means that you've got a lower risk than a reference group that does no physical activity or has low levels of cardio respiratory fitness. So you can see here, we've got about a, looks like about a 15 to 17% reduction. Not bad, I take that. It might surprise people to know that the effects of exercise are quite wide ranging. What can they do for a disease like cancer? Cancer doesn't appear to be restricted to heart or lungs. It appears in all kinds of tissue. And yet when we look at people's leisure time physical activity that they engage in and their risk of 26 of the most common types of cancer in a large cohort of individuals, anybody that sits to the left of this line in terms of their hazard ratio is experiencing lower levels of cancer than people who have relatively low levels of leisure time physical activity. And the results are what we call statistically significant for, I think it's about 15 different types of cancer. So you can see them all listed here. Uh, that's not a bad deal. Again, if this were a pill, take this pill and reduce your risk for 15 of the most common uh, cancers, 26 common cancers that people suffer from. Now, everybody's pretty sharp and they all look down the bottom here and they're like, what is this one here where I've actually got an increased risk? I'll just show you this one down here. So that's malignant melanoma. And the point there is that people who do more leisure time physical activity spend more time outside and in the sunshine and the sun causes melanoma. So this is the uh, por portion of the, the program where I tell everybody uh, to wear sunscreen. Um, diabetes, uh, type two diabetes is the most common type of diabetes. 90% of diabetes cases are type two. Um, it's estimated that probably anywhere from about 15 to 20% of Canadians have type 2 diabetes, although half that number actually know that they have it. Uh, it's the leading cause of adult blindness. It's the leading cause of adult uh, below knee amputations. It's a, it's a disease with a very high uh, morbidity profile. And yet again, when we look at these two figures, we're shifting down in terms of risk in terms of your fitness, this is the cardiovascular side, but interestingly, the stronger you are as well. So this is the strengthening side of the guidelines. Again, we've got about a, almost a 10% reduction here and a little bit greater reduction if you're a little bit stronger. What about dementia and Alzheimer's? When I talk to the people that work out in the facility that I run here at McMaster, and I say, what are your two greatest fears as you get old in terms of your health? They say, I don't want to become a burden. My interpretation is that that means that they're losing their physical mobility and that they want to remain cognitively intact. I'm sure that probably there are lots of people on, on the webinar tonight who either know or have experienced somebody who goes through either dementia or Alzheimer's related dementia. Here's the good news. So I'm just going to give you, this is a fantastic graphic that this group here uh, produced to show you if you are intact in terms of your cognitive function, what physical activity does for you here. So they've got the WHO recommendation and the odds ratio is about 0.6, so a 40% reduction. They've got being more active from, they call it unknown parameters. In other words, not the volume you do, not the intensity, not the type, but they've got a reduction down around 0.65. They've got the volume, in other words, the amount of, of physical activity that you do, the higher it gets, it's a dose response, is a, a greater reduction. They don't say anything about the intensity, so we don't know how hard you need to work out, but I'll show you a little bit of data that suggests that it's not very hard at all. The interesting part is even if you do have a dementia or, or, or Alzheimer's related dementia diagnosis, that if you are active, physically active in terms of doing both strengthening and aerobic activities, your global cognition scores are improved, your physical performance is improved, your activity of daily living performance is, is improved, and probably psychological and quality of life. So even if you do have dementia or Alzheimer's, it is a benefit to be physically active. 
I'm just going to show you this figure and I'll, I'll hopefully I'll decomplicate it for you because it's, it's pretty complex. The line you want to focus on here is the solid dark line in the middle here. And this shows relative risk. And you can see that this is the reference group. So a group that does no physical activity and then the relative risk drops down and it sort of stays flat at about 0.75. There's a small downward trend and it says physical activity level and met minutes per week. Well, let's decomplicate that and say that the physical activity guidelines are here. So the reality is, is that the, the immediate decline in, in risk for dementia here is when you begin to do something. So it, it's when people go from doing nothing to doing something that they get that uh, reduction in risk. So it implies that you don't really need to do uh, that much, which I think is uh, a pretty poignant and significant uh, outcome to take away. So we have what I would call evidence-based support for physical activity and higher fitness and lowering your risk and or improving your prognosis uh, for heart disease, cancers, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, and other forms of dementia, um, although we've got a little bit less data for uh, other forms of dementia. And I think that that in and of itself might be enough to convince most people. But this is the portion of the guidelines with which most people are familiar. I need to go for a walk. I need to get out. I need to ride a bike. I need to hike. I need to swim to improve my cardiovascular fitness. That's the, that's the big part, right? And I say it is. It's important. It's a really big part of what you should do. So this is part of the prescription that, you know, if I'm going to write you a prescription for exercise, I'm like, try and hit this 150 minutes or do something, get out there, go for a walk. What about the, the strengthening part of the guidelines? And the reality is here is that there's probably now a growing appreciation for people as they age to try and mitigate the effects of something called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the progressive age-related loss of muscle mass. Associated with that muscle mass loss is a reduction in strength. The reduction in strength and power, the ability to generate force quickly, is uh, associated then with a reduction in physical mobility and the inability to do physical activi or activities of daily living. Most activities that we do in daily living are against very low resistance. In other words, we don't, you know, we traditionally don't have to throw a bale of hay unless we're a farm worker. Um, we have to pick up grocery bags. We have to walk with grocery bags, with heavy things for a little bit of time. We have to open car doors. We have to push ourselves up and get out of a chair. So these are the types of things that we're trying to mitigate with strengthening activity when we're getting a little bit older. The question is always, when does sarcopenia start? When do we lose that muscle mass? It's hard to say, but the truth is, is we can measure it in earnest in people in their sixth decade of life. So in their 50s. And we can detect differences as early in some individuals, particularly those that are inactive in, in, their, in their fifth decade of life. So in their 40s. But this is nothing new. You can read Socrates' uh, quote here, somewhere around uh, 470 BC. It's a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the strength of which his or her body uh, is capable. And this is the area of my research. And I've tried long and hard to get people to you know, think about being stronger. And they said, well, you know, really, it's heart disease and everything else. And that's really aerobic work. And it wasn't until some studies started coming out that were reanalyses of the sort of, I'll call it the, the grandfather study of all of the aerobic work that came out called the Luke Cooper Longitudinal Aerobic Study. And this is one of those first studies. And, and it's a, a study in which we, the uh, authors looked at all cause mortality and cancer related mortality in people under the age of 60 and over the age of 60. And you can see that they've divided people into the lower, middle, and upper third. We call those tertiles. So if you're under 60 and you are the lowest third in terms of your strength, you maybe have a small increase in risk, but it's not really that big of a deal. Over the age of 60, however, if you're in the lowest third of individuals in terms of your, this is leg strength, 
you have an exaggerated risk for both all cause and cancer related mortality. Compared to those in the upper third, so you don't even need to be in the top 10% or the top 20%, but it'd be good to be in the top 33% and you have a vastly reduced risk. It's almost half in terms of all cause. And I think it's almost three and a half times lower for cancer related mortality. We've got data that's a little bit more granular now. And these authors, this was a paper published just last year in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, have shown the relationship between the amount of muscle strengthening activities done in minutes per week, both all cause, cardiovascular disease related, cancer related, and diabetes related. You can see that the curve sort of goes down and then flattens out and then actually maybe begins to inflect and goes upwards. So the authors highlighted the largest relative reduction in risk and the amount in terms of minutes per week of muscle strengthening activity that you would need to do. For all cause, 40 minutes. For cardiovascular disease, 60 minutes. For cancer, 30 minutes. For diabetes, it's 60 minutes, but actually the, the line continues to go down. So let me just say that if you could get out and do some form of strengthening activity, maybe once a week for 30 minutes, twice a week for 60 minutes, 30 minutes at a session. You don't need to lift the heaviest things you can, even light or light weights lifted to reasonable levels of effort or fatigue work very, very well. You're going to enjoy a reduced risk for a number of diseases. And this is an area that is, um, is growing. And we don't, we don't know as much about being stronger and what it does for you, but we do know that it does reduce risk almost to the same extent as being cardiovascularly fit. So I'm going to show you, I think, which, what is some of the, you know, putting it all together is when you're both fitter and stronger. So you're following that 150 minutes a week, you're doing those two days a week of muscle strengthening activities, and, and here's what happens. And so this is a fantastic paper that just came out last year um, talking about, you know, do we do aerobic work or do you do muscle strengthening work? And, you know, my urging is that there's neither one is better, but both of them together are better than either alone. So I'll show you here. This is what we call the hazard ratio of mortality, all cause mortality. So all deaths, cardiovascular disease related, cancer related, type two diabetes related, and obesity-related mortality. In every instance, if you adhere to the strengthening guidelines, you get a reduction in risk. And you can see there, it's a pretty impressive for type two diabetes. Again, in every instance, you get a reduction in risk if you adhere to the aerobic guidelines, a little bit greater for all cause, greater for cardiovascular disease, about the same for cancer, the same for type two diabetes, and maybe not quite as good for obesity. But the green bar shows what happens when you do both. 6.6, .6, so about a 40%. Uh, 0.5, so about 50%. Um, 0.65, so about 35%. Uh, 60% and 40%. Again, pills that reduce your risk all cause mortality by about 40%, by about 50%, by about 35%, by about 60%. Those are astonishing. If it were a pill, it would be a medical miracle. It would probably knock vaccines off of the top of the heap. But the point I wanna make is, is maybe not about your mortality risk. And I said quality of life, and I said the ability to move around. So a lot of you know that old age is associated with disability, the inability to be able to move physically around your, it begins with your neighborhood, you may lose even the ability to drive is, is going to reduce the amount of area that you can cover in a given day. But if you can't walk and if you can't get around and eventually if you can't get off of the chair, then you're in full time institutionalized care. And I'll just show you a graph here and really I, I won't you know, go over the nitty gritty of it here, but what it shows you is that the effects of resistance training, so weightlifting, and the, the more potent those effects are, the lower the self-reported disability people have. So the stronger people are and the stronger their 
made to become by engaging in weightlifting type activities, they report a lower incidence of disability or the inability to move around. Um, quite a few people submitted questions about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a painful, debilitating disease, a tremendous uh, burden in terms of morbidity. And the reality is, is that a lot of people say exercise is good for osteoporosis and they would recommend walking. But the, when you look at the literature that's out there, it in, and this is a systematic review meta-analysis of randomized control trials with resistance training, so with weightlifting and strengthening exercises, particularly those that don't involve your body weight, but pushing against weight on a machine are the most effective at reducing the symptoms of osteoporosis and maybe even slowing the bone loss that happens. Knee osteoarthritis. I could put hip osteoarthritis here. I could put hand, shoulder, you know, you name the joint. This is the wear and tear arthritis. And again, uh, the role of resistance training, dosing on pain, physical functions in individuals. This is with knee OA, knee osteoarthritis, and the effects are remarkably positive. Um, coming close to the end here, but I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with me in saying that falls are a watershed moment for older people, uh, particularly the oldest old. Uh, we know that a hip fracture past the age of 80 uh, has a mortality rate two years post-fracture of about 50%. So what do we do to prevent falls? Well, there's a lot of you know in-home audits that you can do to clear things around the house, and that's a great way to begin. But to proof yourself against falls, you need to, ex you need to engage in strengthening exercises, and this is where balance comes in. So practicing balancing the exercises, stepping over obstacles, what we call one-legged or tandem stances to try and um, improve your ability to be able to balance yourself. And when you do that, your fall risk is unequivocally reduced. So we have evidence-based support for strengthening in lowering the risk of mortality and or improving the prognosis of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and falls, but we do need to add a little bit of balance to that. So everybody's with me now, right? Everybody's a convert. Um, what do we do? What are we gonna do? So I'm gonna wax a little poetic at the end here, and I'm gonna give you my take on what it means to age well. Uh, and I like to tell people it's like sitting on a stool. Um, the stool has three legs. Here's the first and most important leg. It's to be physically active to incorporate exercise if that's your, that's your thing, if you, if you like to do that, but definitely to move around, to sit less, to try and get that 150 minutes or two and a half hours uh, in, you know, that's, that's five days a week, 30 minutes of physical activity. You can cut it up into very small chunks. If it's intense physical activity, like climbing stairs or walking up a hill, you, you can do less um, that leaves you a lot of other hours in the day to do a lot of other things. So people who say, I don't have time, the answer is quickly find the time. It's there. You just need to make it a priority. So how does it begin? Find an activity you like. I've heard from a number of people. They say, you know, I, I went to a big box gym in January. They had a great membership deal. I, but, but then when I went there, I realized I was one of the older people there. Uh, I didn't really like how they spoke to me, treated me. I thought it didn't fit in. The music was really loud. I, I, you know, it wasn't really, I didn't appeal to me at all. And I asked my son, and they said, I didn't go back. And I'm like, no kidding. Why would anybody go back to something that they don't like to do? So find an activity that you like. Minutes count. Increase your activity level. 10 minutes at a time. Every little bit helps. And this is where I think a lot of, I'll, I'll just call it an injustice has been done in terms of you don't have to sweat. It doesn't require a knockdown, drag them out workout to achieve benefit. 10 minutes, perfect. Get up, move, go for a walk. Active time can be social time. If you enjoy time with other people, look for group activities or classes in your community get together with family and friends. 
It doesn't have to be something that is an arduous grind that you do by yourself that is some sort of physically punishing task. It's fine if you do, if you like to walk or listen to music, or if you like to walk and listen to nature, um, awesome. But if you're like somebody who you know likes other people, likes a little bit of chatter, try and incorporate that. Walk wherever and whenever you can. Take the stairs instead of the elevator when possible. My uh, good friend and uh, happens to be my spouse and I recently completed a study with, with, in cardiovascular disease patients undergoing cardiac rehab. And the form of exercise we chose to get them to do was just stair climbing. And I thought to myself going into this, this is crazy. There's no way these people are gonna get, achieve any kind of benefit. And they achieved exactly the same kind of benefit in recovering from a cardiac event as people who followed the traditional in-gym cardio, uh, cardiovascular rehabilitation. It, it, it's astonishing what climbing stairs can do. You get to the top of the stairs and people don't like to take them because they're like, oh, that's uh, my heart's beating like a rabbit. It's a really, really potent form of, uh, of uh, activity. Carry your groceries home. Uh, resistance exercise, probably weightlifting is not people's favorite, although I'll say to, you know, get a gym, lift some weights. There are lots of ways to make yourself stronger that don't require a gym membership of lifting weight or lifting weights um, that you can do at home. There's lots of online strengthening programs that use your own body weight. What's the second leg? Well, eat well. Um, and I'm not going to give you any specific advice here. Uh, I could spend the next hour, hour and a half, two hours talking about this. It is the other part of what I do here. We talk about dietary manipulation, but I'll just say eat whole foods, eat the stuff that is around the outside of the grocery store, not down the aisles in the middle. And that tends to work relatively well. The third leg is to engage socially. Um, the COVID pandemic showed us what it meant for older people to live in isolation. Uh, people don't do well when they're lonely. They become depressed, things become amplified, and things tend to go downhill. Try and engage in the traditional sense of a social network. Online, social, fine. Um, but for, for me, it means talking to people, to actually spend time with people, with friends, with family members, and have a sense of purpose in life. It can be, for some people, spiritual. I've been told that there should be a fourth leg on the stool. And of course, uh, given the guidelines, it probably should be the leg that supports sleep. But I think what, when you get these three legs together, uh, aging well happens. But I do think that being physically active is the key part of it. So as I said, maybe it's a four-legged stool and uh, it's sleep on the other one. So I'm going to quote somebody at the end here. This is Ron Davis. He was the uh, America, medical, American Medical Association president. Uh, unfortunately, not a particularly successful age. He died of prostate cancer in 2008, but this is his quote. If we had a pill or surgery that contained all the benefits of exercise, it would be the most widely prescribed drug or procedure in the world. So remembering the question that was posed in the video, apologize if you didn't hear it, um, that your last 10 years, or maybe your last 20 years, or maybe for some of us, even our last 30 years, are years that we would like to spend with good quality of life. Mortality is still 100%. Death and taxes, the only two certain things in life. And so it's the quality of the life that you spend. I want to say thank you very much again to uh, the folks at the Optimal Aging Portal and McMaster alumni for allowing me to share my thoughts this evening. Thank you so much, Stu. That was... Uh fantastic overview of the benefits of exercise. Um, we had, you know, hundreds of questions that uh, came in uh, in advance of the webinar. We've got, um, you know, uh, dozens of questions coming in now. So uh, I'll try to uh, summarize some of the frequently asked ones. I I'm actually going to jump a little bit to the section around uh, recovery injury prevention, which was a theme. And, and can there be too much exercise?
is, is there uh, one question that came in tonight was about diminishing returns, but is there, is there such a thing as too much exercise? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like a lot of things, right. You know, some is good, more is better, but, but only to a point. And so, you know, all of those curves show that, that there's a plateau at some point. So what you get back is much less than what you put in at the beginning or, or, or the early stages of doing something. So, and, you know, I, 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 in another phase of my life, probably spent periods where I did too much and my body hurt. Uh, I, I became mentally, I call it stale or, I mean, it's almost depression to say, you know, you're just dragging yourself to a workout. Um, and so it's, you can call it over training or over work, or a lot of people call it under recovery, which I don't know which is which, but um, yeah, you, you, you know, the good stuff happens in recovery. And, and so, you know, one of the axioms that we do know is you get a little bit older is to make sure that you allow yourself enough time to recover from what you've done. And that's when the benefits happen. Are, are there specific recommendations around how best to recover? Mm, probably lots and lots I could talk about around nutrition and sleep and everything else like that. But sleep is definitely regenerative time. Support yourself from a nutritional standpoint. If you're ever in a situation where you're withholding energy or anything else like that, recovery is going to take longer. So it's nothing nuclear that I could quote to you to say, take this amount of time. Um, I'm a big believer in people sort of listening to their, their own feedback. And people say, you know, no pain, no gain. Uh, I say no pain, no pain. Uh, you know, pain is a sign that something's wrong. So pay attention to that and modify your physical activity levels to try and minimize pain. S soreness, okay, I get it. But People recover from soreness, but persistent nagging pain is a sign that there's there's an issue. So you should be working out in terms of strength training and getting some muscle soreness in terms of the the no pain no gain adage. Yeah. But if you're if you're having uh, if the pain is actually limiting your ability to continue to participate in physical activity, if it's nagging, if it's not going away, those are more worrisome signs. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Spot on. The um, there was one, a question that came in talking a bit about the role of stretching specifically. I think in mm -hmm. the in the exercise uh, or the movement guidelines, you talk yeah. about flexibility and balance. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about a role for stretching and also maybe um, what what are what might be some examples with respect to balance and flexibility exercises? Yeah, yeah. Um, it it's interesting, you know, stretching has enjoyed a, a long and very sort of, I'll just call it up and down journey in, in physical fitness. And, you know, for a long time, you had to do this for static stretch, then it was dynamic stretch. Uh, it seems to be that the, we sort of come kind of full circle uh, and that the effects of stretching on sort of injury reduction and everything else like that are probably not that big a deal. Um, you know, and I know I'm going to upset some people in saying that I think stretching feels good for a lot of people and that's why they do it. Uh, the, the balance exercises are around challenging yourself in terms of sort of, you know, it's, it's standing on one foot, uh, it's putting one foot beside the other and in back of each other and trying not to sort of fall over one way or another. Lots of forms of yoga challenge balance, uh, lots of, I mean, the more, probably one of the more studied forms of exercise and you know, almost an art form unto itself is Tai Chi. And the poses and the flow and everything is a continual uh, stressor for balance. It, it's a fantastic form of exercise. Some people say cardiovascularly, I might not agree, but mm. definitely from strengthening and, and, and everything else. And, and it looks artistic besides. And, and there are actually lots of um, different forms of uh, or, or different diseases that have used Tai Chi and, and to, to pretty good effect, actually. Yeah, we, we often recommend it for patients with underlying neurologic difficulties mm -hmm. and uh, with associated balance. And I think there's some evidence of it also simultaneously act activating some of the cognitive aspects because yeah. of the poses and the positions, maybe. Right. Than, it's, it's, so it's continually it. changing. And yeah. so it's always a challenge. Um, and you know, some of that sort of is incorporated into strength work where you're going from this exercise to this exercise, yeah. as opposed to just pedaling on a bike where it's pretty repetitive. And so something that challenges the cognitive aspects of things, but yeah, your points well taken for sure. 
Um, so there's a lot of hype in the news about 10,000 steps. Uh, what What's the deal with the magic 10,000 steps a day? Yeah, the, the, the origins of 10,000 steps are, are astonishing. I mean, it's really, it was a Japanese company that came out with the sort of early stage pedometers um, and, you know, gave them away free. I, you know, I don't want to say in a cereal box, but something like that and said, you know, and 10,000 just seemed like a kind of round number. Um, in my experience with, you know, things like I have my aura ring on here or your Fitbit or some sort of hip worm pedometer and even fancier devices that we use, it takes me, if I just walk, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes to do 10,000 steps. So you can't just, the amount of walking I do, you know, I, I'm in my office here. So, you know, sometimes I walk and get a coffee. And if I walk back, that takes about 2,500 steps. So if I guess if I did that four times, I don't drink that much coffee. <laughs> I, I could rack up 10,000 steps. So, but you do, I think for most people, it requires some, some concerted uh, effort to get out and do that. There's you know, the magic of 10,000 is, is, uh, well, it's a great number to aim for. If you're doing 10,000, you're, you're probably in pretty good shape and you're getting a lot of benefit. It, people, we think it starts around, you know, really begins to take off around five to 6,000. But for some people, um, if you're doing only 2,000 a day, then going up to 4,000 is, is a big difference and you, and you would get a benefit from that. But 10,000, like if you hit it every day, good, good for you. Uh, I, I don't like it. And, you know, you get a little ring on your watch and that, you know, so there's a, uh, but it's, it's not that there's something magic about it. So uh, one of the questions that came in is from somebody who's been inactive for a long time. Right. And, and so I guess, is it ever too late to start? Mm. Um, and are there, you know, any special considerations if you've been inactive for a while and maybe you're later in life and you're looking to uh, get back into a higher activity or exercise level? Yeah. So first it's never too late. And um, I mean, we've got studies out there in, in nonagenarians, so 90 year old plus individuals where they've made gains in strength and fitness and improved quality of life. And it's, so I, I always say it's never too late. Uh, start slow, start small, progress gradually, see how you feel. Always do something that you like, because at that stage of your life, if you haven't done it, the chances are is that you're maybe going to be a little adverse to, to something too drastic. And so don't sign up for something where you go, oh, geez, you know, this is go for a walk first. Uh, maybe go for a walk. Particularly, I find uh, with people, they walk in nature and there's another sort of maybe cognitive link with, with that sort of environment. Uh, and I, I think that that's probably the best way to start. We had quite a few questions about uh, sort of getting into specific exercises, which I'll, I'll ask about in a second, but uh, you presented about sarcopenia. And one mm -hmm. of the questions that came in was, can uh, age-related muscle decline or sarcopenia, can it be reversed or slowed down yeah. to uh, increased activity and exercise? <laughs> yeah. It, it can be reversed. It's it's sort of like, you know, I mean, the, the trajectory is downward and it can sort of, you know, you can kind of bend the line up. At some point, aging just happens and, and it's going to go down. So I think what we're talking about is more mitigating the decline rather than talking about reversal. But I have heard stories and we've got data to show that even people in their 60s and 70s are able to gain a little bit of muscle the net result, you know, into your 70s and 80s, it's, is it's going to go down, but it, it appears that the muscle story is somewhat like the osteoporosis story and that you want to sort of hit those years where it's going down with a high muscle mass and some good strength mm. so that you can buffer yourself against the decline. Uh, it's the same with bone, bone density going into the menopause uh, with women is to say, try and build it up to the highest level you can because you know it's going to go down. It, it may be the same with brain health and uh, education yeah. is, uh, you know, uh, one of the risk yeah. factors, uh, yeah. lower levels of education for cognitive health. Yeah. Um, what about uh, the type of weight or resistance exercise, sort of 
hand weights versus body weights versus squats uh anything bands there was a question about resistance bands yeah everything everything and anything works uh the the gauge we like to use in the facility down here pace the physical activity center of excellence that i direct is is to say we have scales on the wall where 10 is red and it's a you know that's a flat out i'm i'm exhausted and we say, try and aim for the orange or the yellow. So it's a seven or an eight out of 10. So you're doing it to a high degree of effort. And it doesn't matter whether it's a lightweight, a heavyweight, an elastic band, stepping up stairs, uh, body weight workout. It, it, it absolutely doesn't matter. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of bands. I think they work very, very well. The, the, the bands that are out there now are, are, are excellent. Uh, compared to the ones even 10 mm. years ago. So anything like that that works, anything where you feel you're having to push and you're getting a, a strengthening type motion is, is going to do some benefit for you. I think you mentioned as well, just there's a lot of body weight exercises. Oh. Yeah, You don't need fancy gym for lunges and squats and things like I, that, even without weight. I, I gave up my gym membership during during COVID. <laughs> And, and I've never gone back. I, I I do it all in my basement and it's pretty much all body weight and band work now. I, I it was like I was reborn and and, and uh, I've just uh, I enjoy it too much there. So um, it, what about uh, the the hype around HIT H I I T or high <laughs> yeah. intensity interval training? Can you say? Yeah, about that? Uh, well, I have a good friend and colleague, um, Dr. Martin Gabala, who is a proponent of high intensity interval training. Uh, for some people, it, it's extraordinary in, in terms of the benefits you get. Uh, some people don't like working that hard, even though you can do it for a very short period of time. I think one of the things, and um, you know, my, my wife always makes this point, is we're going to march slowly in place for 30 minutes, or we're going to sprint quickly in place for five minutes. And, but your risk for something going wrong is greater in the five minutes. Which one would you rather do? And it was, oh, I'll do the 30 minutes. And I'm like, well, if you say to me, I only have five or 10 minutes, then maybe the hip work is the, is the right one for you. But the stair climbing example that I gave is really uh, one that impressed me in terms of how little pretty sort of short, high intensity bouts did for these, these folks. It was, it was impressive. Do you have any specific advice or general? advice, I guess, for, for people who might have a range of specific health conditions. So well, you did touch on some of the uh, risk reduction and preventative aspects and benefits in conditions, but we did have a lot of questions come in from people yeah. talking about either arthritis or yeah. uh, diabetes. And, and are there any specific recommendations around exercise in those contexts? Yeah. So anybody with a condition like that needs a little bit of extra monitoring and help. Um, you know, we, we deal exclusively with, I'll call them clinical populations in, in our facility here. And uh, it's not like, you know, we check you in and see you later. Um, we have people beside other people and saying, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What, what's your form? Uh, and checking on them, you know, how do you feel? Are you breathless? If you're breathless, stop. And so there's a degree of monitoring that probably needs to happen for anybody that has something that limits them either, you know, from a disease perspective or a physical perspective. Um, people at the YMCA, if you can find one, do do fantastic jobs around, you know, finding classes for people with mm -hmm. heart disease, classes for people with type 2 diabetes, classes for people with knee and hip osteoarthritis, and not even that that's a homogeneous group, appreciating yeah. that everybody's a little bit different. But in all of those cases, I could, you know, we could name a, a spectrum of conditions. Exercise has always been shown to benefit. So um, it, it, I get it. it it's a challenge, um, but it's, it's worth it in the end. And any recommendations for people who may be using assistive devices or mm. have uh, mobility issues? Yeah. Uh, so one of the populations that we service here is people with a spinal cord injury. So I don't think you can uh, get any more compromised than a lot of these folks, but they come in and they do the forms of exercise that they can do. So if you can't, if you're, if you're for example, if you're in a walker, then you do your exercise sitting down. Um, there are routines that are, that are geared around those people. 
uh, and they still achieve benefits. It doesn't require a lot of, you know, getting up and getting down, but sometimes it does challenge that. And, you know, there are sets of exercise guidelines for people with spinal cord injuries and uh, all kinds of other physical uh, mobility limitations as well. So again, um, everybody, if they, they adhere to it and, and, and keep it up, they do get benefits. I feel like we uh, we could spend a, a couple more hours just going through uh, questions, but I, I, I'm conscious of the of the time, and uh, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, tonight, Stu. I, I am going to share okay. a couple of uh, sort of closing uh, slides, and I'll highlight uh, uh, you and and Martin have a great course on. Uh, Coursera, uh, hacking health, uh, hacking exercise for health, which uh, I think is uh, one of the most popular uh, courses on Coursera. Actually, you have over sixty thousand enrollees there. So, um, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, we have evidence-based content uh, that can be delivered weekly to your inbox. There's a subscribe button; it's free, and uh, we support evidence webinars as well as other content on the portal. Uh, the weekly email alerts will feature uh, uh, online learning modules, videos, uh, alert you to live events like this one, and uh, also include uh, evidence-based uh, health and social blog posts uh, uh, in, in the weekly email alert. We have a series of video posts, and uh, I think uh, the Alumni Association has posted in the chat the recording of webinar will be available through the alumni's YouTube channel. It will also be posted uh, through the McMaster Optimal Aging portal. Uh, we have a whole e-learning series. Uh, you can access it on the e-learning tab at the top of the menu. And uh, there's a, a major focus on mobility, including uh, an e-learning lesson on uh, osteoarthritis and exercise, which has some specific exercises for people with hip and knee uh, arthritis. There's also an e-learning lesson, uh, lesson on walking speed and how to measure uh, walking speed while you're putting in your 10,000. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the YouTube channel, the Alumni Association's YouTube channel, we also will post the webinar on the portal's YouTube channel. So uh, I, uh, I, I hope people can join us again uh, March 1st at 7. Uh, you know, one of the things that, Stu, you alluded to is, uh, well, we a little bit about it. It's not always easy to get motivated uh, to carve off the time. Uh, so uh, Diana Sharafali, who is in the School of Nursing, will be talking a little bit more about uh, how to potentially embrace and uh, address some of the, the lifestyle changes and motivation uh, that are one of the other big challenges. We know uh, physical activity and exercise uh, are helpful, uh, but how do we make some of those Changes in our life and overcome some of those challenges around lifestyle. So uh, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today, and especially our uh, presenter, uh, Stu Phillips. That was a fantastic talk.